we bid you welcome who come with weary spirit seeking rest, who come with troubles that are too much with you, who come hurt and afraid, we bid you welcome, who come with hope in your heart, who come with anticipation in your step, who come proud and joyous, we bid you welcome, who are seekers of a new faith, who come to explore, who come to learn, we bid you welcome, who enter this morning as a homecoming, who have found here room for your spirit, who find in this people a family. Whoever you are, however you are, wherever you are on your journey, we bid you welcome. The words of Richard Gilbert. Good morning and welcome to First Unitarian Church. I'm Angela Herrera, the senior minister. It's July 5th, 2020, a new morning on a day that has never existed before, and it's good to be together. I'm joined this morning by our Associate Minister, Bob Lavalli, and our Director of Music, Susan Peck. A wonderful crew of volunteers is working alongside us this morning, including our DJ running the tech behind the scenes on Zoom, Chris Paul. And our lay worship leader this morning is Raven Reed Starr. You may recognize Raven from our services in the sanctuary. This is her first time helping to lead a Sunday service on Zoom. Welcome, Raven. And she is going to get us rolling with a couple of announcements. Good morning. We are so glad you are joining us here on this beautiful July morning. If you're interested in becoming a member, you can contact Lara Magnuson directly at the link in the chat bar or go to the online form in the chat bar. Online signing services happen on the first Sunday of every month, including today. Starting last week, we slightly loosened our security protocols to allow folks to message each other one-to-one -one during the prelude and the postlude. Prior to this, congregants could only send private messages to the worship leaders. Our hope is that this will foster connection and community. If anyone receives a private message that is unwelcome or inappropriate, please let the worship leaders know. And as always, everyone is invited to stay for coffee hour in our breakfast room following the service. Breakout room. As we light our chalices and candles this morning, I've asked Raven to read words by the Persian mystic Rumi. What is praised is one, so the praise is one too. Many jugs being poured into a huge basin. All religions, all this singing, one song. The differences are just illusion and vanity. Sunlight looks slightly different on this wall than it does on that wall and a lot different on this other one, but it is still one light. We have borrowed these clothes, these time and space personalities from a light, and when we praise, we pour them back in. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Miranda Magnuson. Will you join me in the children's affirmation? We are Unitarian Universalists. We are a people of faith with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. Hey kids, Carl and Sheldon told me they have something they want to show me. Do you want to help me call them? Let's call them. Carl, Carl, Sheldon, Sheldon. Oh, what's this, Carl? <laughs> Angela. Oh, and Sheldon has one too. What's this? For president. Looks like you made me a campaign sign. Oh, that's sweet. It's not a sign. It's a sticker? A bumper sticker? Oh, yeah, they are sticky. I, they're sticking to me right now. I feel that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not running for president anymore. I ran for president just for 20 minutes last Sunday, and, and that was it. But thanks for the bumper sticker anyway. You have 150 stickers? Oh, Carl, I'm sorry that you went to all that work when I'm not running for pre wait, wait a second. Are you joking? No, it's not a joke. You really have 150 stickers? Sheldon helped you and he worked really fast? Now that has to be a joke, Carl. It's not? You're gonna show me the stickers? <laughs> okay, go get them. What is he talking about, Sheldon? You're fast with stickers because you can feel them? I don't understand what's going on right now. Oh, 150 stickers in this little box? Um, oh, <laughs> I see. They're, ouch! Well, goat heads. I get it. These are the stickers you guys were collecting, and I can see why Sheldon would be very good at feeling the stickers. Great joke, Carl. Very funny. Just like me running for president. <laughs> you know, running for president was a lot of fun, but it wasn't just a joke, Carl. It was, it was really more like pretending. And by pretending to run for president, that, that gave me a chance to think about what important things I would say to people. Oh, Carl says if he were president, he would make people worship him. Uh-huh, there's the God pose. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, Carl, one of the things we treasure about this country is that the president cannot tell people how to worship. What's up, Lucia? If you were president, you would make sure that everybody was treated fairly, even if they're from far away? Yeah, that sounds good. And, and since you're from far away, I can see why that would be especially important to you. Yeah. You know, kids, that's one of our UU principles. We believe that everybody should be treated fairly. When I ran for president last Sunday, I talked a lot about how for a long time, some people in our country have been treated very badly, either because of racism or because they were born in a different country and then they came here. A lot of immigrants coming into the United States get put in jail, even though they haven't done anything wrong. And that doesn't sound fair or right, does it? As president, I would try to organize the government so that people coming in would be treated fairly and with respect. If you see somebody being unfair, you'll bite them? <laughs> well, Carl, I appreciate how you get mad about injustice, but I would like to have less biting. If I were president, I would support taking a bite out of budgets that support violence. And if I were president, I would spend less on fighting wars and more on making sure that sick people can go see a doctor, even if they don't have very much money. And if I were president, oh, wait, wait. I'm not trying to be president anymore. I'm just gonna stay a regular person. Just a regular person who has regular conversations with puppets. <laughs> you know, but even a president can't fix all the problems in our country. It's gonna take a whole lot of regular people to fix things. People working together to do big things like ending wars and making sure that everybody is treated well. And that means everybody is important to making things better. Everybody has power. Okay? You don't think I would make a good president? Well, I'm glad you think so, Lucia. But I have a lot of important work to do right here in Albuquerque, like doing my part to create a more just community right here in New Mexico, and watching after all of you guys. And then there's being the senior minister of First Unitarian Church. That's a pretty big job. You guys can keep helping me with that, all right? Okay, well, I think it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye, you guys, goodbye. Like, 
you have to admire their passion and creativity. Mm. There's a misunderstanding that meditation is a solitary act by an individual. The truth is, when we sit in meditation, we sit with the whole world and with all of creation. Meditation is not a retreat. It's a process of trying to see the whole world as it is, beginning by first seeing our minds as they are. As we move into silent meditation today, I invite us to feel the presence of this community around us. We can take a, movement, a moment to move into gallery mode on Zoom and look at the faces of the people who are journeying with us. See who's here with us, our, our kindred seekers. As we sit in silence, sense the presence of our companions. Let us begin. In the sharing of joys and concerns, our happiness is multiplied and our burdens are lessened. When the video begins, share your joys and concerns in the chat bar that we may hold them together. If you are not able to write them in the chat bar, we'd still love to know what's on your heart. Send an email to caring at first uabq.org and let us know how you're doing. Let's share our joys with the first slide and our concerns with the second slide.
I want to invite us now into prayer. And we'll pause the chat so that we can put our hearts together. We see each other in our prayers. We see the joy of birds and ducklings, of the family. We see people preparing their relationships with their family and their children. We see, we, uh, we are grateful for the care that our members and friends and loved ones get at La Vida Yena and pray for their continued safety. And we celebrate with Marilyn O'Boyle, her new great-granddaughter. Congratulations. And we see our concerns, our concerns about COVID, about being sick ourselves, seeing other people get sick, seeing the rising numbers. We see our concern for those struggling with mental health, depression and loneliness. We see Sharon Stepler in the hospital, praying for her safety, her health, her comfort, and her rapid recovery. We pray for a divided country. We lift up all these prayers and prayers held in our hearts, unspoken, but no less deeply felt. We lift them all up to the powers of healing and renewal and celebration that are known by many names. We remember Margaret Rickert, who passed last week. We pray for comfort for her family and her friends. May light perpetual shine upon her. We pray for Judy Gehring's dear friend, Bev Debicer Spencer, as she begins chemotherapy May she find healing and rest. In this community, we seek to practice love for ourselves and love for each other. We seek to practice love for the world. And it begins with cultivating a sense of peace and a sense of groundedness. May we find our connections to that which, which brings us ease. May every breath bring us ease. May we know and feel our interconnectedness in our bodies and in our hearts. May every breath bring us ease. May we find the balms that heal our anxieties, our loneliness, our self-doubt. May every breath bring us ease. May we know that we are enough. May we know that we are not alone. May we bring justice and caring into the world. May every breath bring us ease. And may we all be held in the heart of love. Peace be with you.
The 4th of July always reminds me of how when you're a little kid, your dad teaches you to evade the police. No? Not everybody? Not even a little bit? I have a vivid memory of being a little kid and sitting in the back of our car and behind me in the back back of the station wagon, there was a pile of illegal fireworks that we had just bought across state lines. And my dad told me that if we got pulled over by the police, I was to lie. I was to say that we were not taking those fireworks home, but to a friend's house in the state where they were legal. Imagine my excitement. My dad was generally a law abiding person but the law seemed unreasonable to him. And so we conspired against the authorities, which in a nutshell is the spirit of Independence Day, is it not? Well, I think that's probably debatable. And well, sometimes unpopular laws exist for a good reason. Later on, it was an illegal firework that launched off the ground and over the crowd of neighbors to the back where I had retreated away from the pyrotechnics and it landed right about here in the crook of my neck and it set my hair on fire. I will never forget the swarm of adults turning and descending on me all at once to try to put it out. And I remember very vividly that there was a kiddie pool full of slimy looking water next to me and I was sure they were gonna dunk me in it. I remember thinking that was gonna be so disgusting and then miraculously the fire was out. I got a second degree burn and a new haircut, but luckily no lasting damage. This year, new temporary laws restrict our celebrations in a different way. No groups, no public events. And I do encourage us all each to do our part to keep each other safe, even if you feel like you've got things under control. Because in truth, it might be someone who's not even in sight who gets hurt. Anyway, this holiday weekend is about so much more than fireworks, right? More than fireworks and parties. We grow up hearing this part of the Declaration of Independence, and I'll bet many of you can say it with me. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration says that governments exist to secure those rights and that whenever a government becomes destructive of them, the people have a right to change or abolish it. Among the intolerable grievances the colonists name in the Declaration, there are these two, quartering large bodies of armed troops among us and protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. In other words, armed officers killing people and not being held accountable. It's hard to miss the parallels today. And later they also state that the crown, quote, has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. A little further down the page, the Declaration uses a dehumanizing racist term to refer to the original, original inhabitants of this continent, and they do this without any apparent awareness of the self-contradiction that creates. As I read the words plunder and ravage, I thought of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the protest at Standing Rock. Again, hard to miss. There are still people in prison who were arrested for that protest for protesting, which is a violation of their rights. And now they're at risk for COVID-19. Just this week, I signed a letter with hundreds of clergy demanding their release. After a public reading of the Declaration of Independence in New York on July 9th, 1776, colonists pulled down a statue of King George III. There's a picture of it. I'm not sure how well the detail will come through on your Zoom screen, but if you call to mind any picture of a statue being toppled recently, well, you've got it. That's what it looks like. Thanks, Chris. Let America be America again, wrote the poet Langston Hughes. Seems like America's doing that. 
I think one reason so many people feel surprised by it is that they've only learned a limited amount of US history, and that was taught with a certain spin. The stories we tell about the past shape our understanding of the present. They really determine our understanding of the present. Remembering and retelling other stories, the ones that reveal different perspectives, well, that deepens and expands our understanding of our country and of ourselves. So I want to retell a story about where we are today, about the place we call New Mexico. Some of you will remember this story from several years ago, about six years ago. And like all good stories, this one wants to be retold. Each time we hear a story, we've changed. And so who knows, you might find yourself hearing it with new ears. Of course, New Mexico was not part of the US when the Declaration of Independence was signed, sealed, and delivered. In 1776, the land we call New Mexico had been under Spanish occupation for almost 200 years, and it still was. I say the land we call New Mexico and not just New Mexico, because it's also been known by other names like Mexico and New Spain and Apacheria and Comancheria. And this land was called by other names in languages that have been here much, much longer than Spanish and English, languages like Tanoan and Karasan, Zuni and Navajo, which are still spoken here. In 1776, this land was occupied by Spain, and it became part of the U.S. Some would say it became occupied by the U.S. later. That happened because of the Mexican-American War, which I'll bet you know. But do you remember why the Mexican-American War happened? This is important in US history, and so it's worth repeating. The Mexican-American War happened because in 1829, Mexico abolished slavery. Texas was part of Mexico at that time, but it was inhabited by white settlers who owned slaves, and they were not happy about Mexican abolition. So Texas rebelled, and it became part of the US where they could still have slaves. From there, the US provoked a boundary dispute with Mexico. And by the end of the ensuing war, Mexico had lost one third of its land, including the land we're on now, and nearly all of present day California, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona, a huge chunk of land. Last week, I talked about Juneteenth and how long it took for news that slaves were free to reach Galveston, Texas. Well, Texas had joined the US for the purpose of keeping slaves, and that state was gonna hold out for as long as it could. Meanwhile, the land we call New Mexico had been a place of struggle for generations. The story I'm going to tell takes place in a certain part of this beautiful land, the part we now call Tierra Maria. The name is Spanish for a yellow earth, which doesn't even begin to capture the beauty of the place. This is the land up in northern New Mexico near Ghost Ranch, where I think many of you have probably visited. It's the kind of landscape that Georgia O'Keeffe made famous in her paintings. In the 17th century, Spain and then Mexico had pushed into the area, driving out native people. It was not a smooth or easy transition. The people fought for their homeland, the place of ancestors, of creation stories, of their lives. They drove the invaders out multiple times, including during the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, when Pueblos across New Mexico united and they purged the Spanish completely for 12 years. And even after Spain returned, the native people maintained their claims to the land. In fact, across the US, native communities today will point out that they have still never signed anything giving up their claim to the land. Many communities will point this out. In the 17 and 1800s, even after the land at Tierra Maria had been granted to groups of farmers and ranchers who were themselves subject to colonial rule, the native people continued to fight for it, sometimes driving the settlers away again. But eventually, the settlers won out in that area, and the Tierra Maria land grant was settled. Each family would have a plot to work with a shared area for water access and gra grazing. So each family had a plot, and then they shared the water access and the grazing area. And in this way, the land grant, like other land grants in this area, and then up into Southern Colorado as well, were communal. Nobody owned the entire thing, 
but everybody had a share in it, everybody except the native people. They had not disappeared, by the way, but had moved into other areas and are still here. Tierra Maria had, was lost to the settlers, and then there the settlers stayed. And time passed, and the grandchildren of the people who had moved onto Tierra Maria thought of the land as theirs. And why wouldn't they at that point? They and their children had been born there. There was no other home for them. They depended on it. Then the U.S.-Mexican War happened, for the reasons I mentioned. When the U.S.-Mexican Treaty was signed, turning northern Mexico over to the American government, turning it into the southwestern U.S., the treaty promised to protect the settlers' families' claims to the land. The promise was that the people living on those land grants at the time could stay in place and their heirs would inherit it just as they had. But once the transfer had been made to the American government, things changed again. Corrupt government officials seeking to make money partnered with investors who reinterpreted the treaty, the law, according to their own aims. And when recording who owned the land grant, they listed just one person at the owner. They ignored the complexities of common property. So later, that owner sold the property, not realizing he would be selling it out from under his neighbors. And soon all of the land had been taken right out from under its inhabitants. Like the native people, now the land grant heirs did not go passively either. They fought for the land, squatting there, cutting fences, threatening the newcomers who claimed to own the land they'd had in their families for generations. Meanwhile, the land changed hands again and again on paper. It belonged to investors in New York and Boston and even England, which strikes me as very ironic. They played this out for generations. Many investors had no idea they were purchasing disputed land. And there were occasional flare-ups, but also many heirs simply moved into other little villages around northern New Mexico and tried to make the best of it. And this story was mostly unknown outside of the area, area until the 1960s, when activists from the Chicano rights movement, a part of the civil rights movement, partnered with the heirs of the Tierra Maria land grant, and they accused the US government of land theft. In his book, Properties of Violence, the UNM professor, David Correa, describes the leader of this movement, a charismatic man named Reyes Lopez Tijerina, who reignited the fight. So he was the leader of the Tierra Amaria land grant dispute of the 60s. He threatened to seize private lands from ranchers. He organized sit-ins on former land grants controlled by the US Forest Service, which he called an occupying force in New Mexico. And he attempted to make citizens arrests of prominent political figures, including Warren Burger, the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court. Thousands of heirs to the land rallied around him and he caught the attention of federal authorities. The FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had him tailed everywhere he went. On June 5th, 1967, their battle culminated when Tijerina led a raid on the Rio Arriba County Courthouse. The raid's goal was first to free prisoners who had been arrested in the land grant dispute, and second, to place the district attorney under citizen's arrest. It did not go well. Neither the prisoners nor the district attorney were even there in the building, but a gunfight broke out. And at the end of the raid, two officials had been shot and two people had been kidnapped. The raiders fled into the mountains where police helicopters buzzed overhead and National Guard tanks crashed through rural dirt roads in search of the rebels. Can you imagine this? National Guard tanks crashing through rural roads in beautiful Northern New Mexico. Suddenly Tijerina was famous. The Nation of Islam leader Elijah Muhammad invited him to speak, and so did the Poor People's Campaign, who asked him to stand in, along with Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson, for Martin Luther King Jr. after King was killed. Tijerina also was arrested and eventually incarcerated. On Thursday this week, I had the opportunity to speak with somebody who met Reyes Lopez Tijerina back in the 1970s after he got out of prison. It was a lawyer who had also worked on a dispute over a land grant 
but he had done so in southern Colorado a few years after the Tierra Maria dispute. And he told me that thanks in part to Tijerina inspiring people to take a stand, the case in southern Colorado was successful. The land was actually restored to communal ownership by the families that had been there for generations since before the US-Mexican border crossed them when that treaty was signed, ever since it had been taken from the native people. The history of colonization, racism, theft, and violence in the United States makes a complicated present. But if we are afraid to take an honest look at it, if we avoid the truth because it's messy, who does that serve? Who maintains a lot of privilege based on past wrongs? And who continues to be relegated to the margins of society with poverty compounding on poverty? They have plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people, says the Declaration of Independence. It doesn't have to keep being this way. We don't have to keep pretending there's nothing we can do about it. When the government becomes destructive of the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when it treats some people as less than others, then it is the right of the people to change it. For these reasons and so many more, I deeply believe that the US needs to establish a truth commission to examine the impact of racism and racist policies and laws from our country's founding until today. And why am I telling this story in a church? Is this a sermon or a history lesson, right? It's a sermon because it matters not just what the facts are, it also matters what we believe. The Spanish and then the English occupied and ravaged this land, believing that it was what God wanted them to do. The Spanish believed that the earth belonged to God and that the Catholic Church was God's representative on earth, and so the earth belonged to the church. American colonists believed it was their religious duty and destiny to take over North America. And all across the country this morning on this 4th of July weekend, I guarantee you there are preachers delivering a similar message still. In truth, Unitarians in the 19th century participated in efforts to convert Native Americans to Christianity in the 1800s, something for which our denomination has repented and apologized. And today, the Unitarian Universalist Church is an active partner in the fight for indigenous rights and in the work of dismantling racism. That means we tell the stories. It means we teach and preach and live the truth that all means all. That when the ancient creation story says humans are made in the image of the divine, it means all humans. That all men are created equal means all humans. And that our first principle the inherent worth and dignity of every person means everyone. This morning's story is a story of land, displacement and greed, of remembering and forgetting. And it's a story about borders, about the ones that we draw and redraw on maps and about the ones that we draw around history, limiting what we will acknowledge of it. And those borders divide whole groups of people from each other. They create seemingly separate Americas. And so I'm going to close by reminding us of the words of the writer and poet Gina Valdez, first in Spanish, which is the language she wrote this in, and then in English. Valdez writes, Hay tantísimas fronteras que dividen a la gente, pero por cada frontera existe también un puente. There are so many borders that divide people, but for every border, there is also a bridge. As we prepare to take up the offering, I want to remind you that our change for the future recipient for this quarter is still Oxford House, an organization that provides residential support to people in recovery. You can make an offering online by clicking the link that we'll put in the chat box. If you prefer not to give online, you can simply mail a check to the church office. We will now take up the offering for the work of this church 
and the work of this church in the community. Color and sky, brush and blue, scarlet fleece changes hue, crimson falls tints from view. generously given is received with gratitude. Thank you on behalf of the congregation and on behalf of Oxford House. We are coming to the end of our formal service this morning. After the postlude, you're invited to stay on for small group breakout rooms and to join those. Just remain on this Zoom call and we'll automatically connect you. We also have two special group chats happening today. Um, so in addition to the usual special group for our UUs in the Socorro area, there's also a group specially created by and for folks who identify as people of color. The link for that room will be placed in the chat box when the credits begin to roll. And so to join either of those special groups, you'll click those links and leave this meeting and go to those during the postlude. And now as we extinguish our chalices and candles, I'm going to share once more that quote from Gina Valdez. Maybe you'd like to take it with you into your small group chats as a discussion starter. Hay tantísimas fronteras que dividen a la gente, pero por cada frontera existe también un puente. There are so many borders that divide people, but for every border, there's also a bridge. I am missing my chalice extinguisher, so I'm going to extinguish it in a second. Go in peace, friends. May love bless you and keep you until we're gathered again. Blessed be. <laughs>